The single biggest challenge that we were faced with as an eating disorders work group in revising DSM-4 and recommending DSM-5 was that in DSM-4, a very large number of people who come to eating disorders programs for treatment didn't receive an official DSM-4 diagnosis. A majority, often, receive the nonspecific diagnosis of eating disorder not otherwise specified. And that conveys very little information about what to do for these people. And so the, um, the single biggest problem we were trying to fix was reduce the frequency of use of this uh, unspecified category. I think this, the single biggest change shouldn't come as a great surprise. It is the official recognition of a disorder called binge eating disorder. Binge eating disorder, which, it, it should, which describes or, or captures folks who have uncontrolled episodes of binge eating but do not engage in regular episodes of purging, which is essentially the essence of bulimia nervosa. So binge eating disorder actually was described and articulated uh, at the time DSM-4 was put together almost 20 years ago. Um, but uh, the belief then, I think correctly, was that there was inadequate data at that time to recognize it. So it was actually mentioned in the, in the official criteria as an example of a not otherwise specified eating disorder. And a criteria set were included in the appendix to DSM-4. Um, and one of the things that we, I think, kind of knew, kind of sensed getting into it, but were able to prove is there were over a thousand articles published since DSM-4 on binge eating disorder. Um, and so that really, uh, and they documented that this is a useful uh, set of criteria defining uh, a problem suffered by a number of individuals who want help. And that really, and so we, we recommended and the, um, the DSM-5 task force as a whole, and in the end, the American Psychiatric Association approved their recommendation that binge eating disorder be officially recognized in DSM-5. And that's probably the single biggest change. Uh, the other significant change uh, is a clarification that led to a new label, a new name uh, for a collection of disorders. And um, the group was asked to take on some of the other feeding disorders that had been described for many, many years uh, among younger populations. And one of these, feeding disorder of infancy or, or early, early childhood, childhood um, was a little used category um, that we were asked to consider. And at the end of the day, landed with a new name, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, nicknamed ARFID, right, for that acronym, um, that really, I think, uh, will be a very useful category for folks who aren't thinking about some of the body image issues that are so um, typical of our classic eating mm -hmm. disorders like anorexia nervosa, um, but will um, uh, nevertheless uh, sometimes uh, lead to some very significant nutritional and um, behavioral disturbances. So this new group, this ARFID group, will um, probably be another notable mm -hmm. new part of DSM-5. And the real hope with DSM-5 is that we have established more clinically useful categories that will help individuals um, uh, identify uh, what it is that's wrong, will help clinicians know how best to take care of uh, folks with these disorders, and will help uh, the insurance industry understand the severity um, uh, and understand that these are the individuals who indeed need treatment.